Welcome back to Sunday Morning Worship, and unfortunately this past week, Premier Ford extended the state of emergency for the whole month of June. So unfortunately, we're going to have to continue doing this for uh, at least the remainder of this month. And uh, it, it's a disappointment, but at the same point in time, uh, let's celebrate the opportunities that we do have uh, to be able to worship with each other through this technology. And, and there's other things that are really cool that are going on as well, too. I know a number of uh, online Bible studies that are happening. People are meeting over Zoom, using Right Now Media. I just want to encourage that kind of fellowship. There's been some really cool things that have been going on in the life of the church, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet uh, joined or created a Bible study, do that. Uh, talk to some friends or contact a church office, contact myself and just say, hey, I'm interested in that. So that way we can make use of this time instead of just feeling down and dragged out by it all, that we can at least develop our relationships with each other as well as deepen our relationship with God. So uh, for today, I just want to highlight a couple of things we made mention of last week. So first of all, uh, I want to talk again about the Bridge app. Um, a few people thought that we were ready to launch. We're not quite ready to launch just yet, so uh, hold on to that. Uh, so if you've already downloaded that app, that, that's fine, but we still have to get a few more things in the database and still work out a few of the kinks. We're not fully sure when we're going to have it to launch, but uh, when it's ready to launch, we will let you know about that. And again, uh, that's a database in which we can be able to connect with each other. We can have an ongoing church cal calendar. Uh, all of our information will be in there, phone numbers, email addresses, that sort of stuff. So if you don't want your information in there, uh, please contact the church office, contact Monica and uh, let her know that. Um, and again, just really want to highlight that it's, it's extremely private and secure. Your information will not be leaked anywhere. It's, it's just going to remain within our congregation. Uh and so the second thing I want to bring to your attention is our second offering. We have been taking second offerings throughout COVID. Uh, but we also realized a number, number of you wanted to have it more explicit as to what the second offering was for. This morning, this second offering is for Faith Promise. And that is when we have a designated uh, amount of our money that goes to the missionaries that we support, both locally as well as overseas. And that's something that we commit to at the beginning of the, each year. And we invite each one of you to commit to at the beginning of each year. So that's what our second offering is for. Um, and if you're a guest, if you're not a member of our church, feel no pressure when we pass the bag around because you're not going to have the bag come to your house. And unless someone comes ringing your doorbell, maybe don't give them money. All right, so moving on to the third thing I want to draw your attention to. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the nomination of office bearers. We are in that time of year in which we're looking for new elders and new deacons. So with that, uh, we're trying to figure out how exactly are we going to navigate that with COVID-19 because we, we have a policy within our denomination as well as some bylaws within our own church in which the, we have processes and protocols that we have to go, for, uh, go through. And one of those things is saying that we need to have uh, everyone that's uh, a member of the congregation over the age of 18 to approve the candidates that we have. We don't know how we're going to do that when this place is empty. We don't see how it would be really effective to try and get everyone to somehow submit and register a vote. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to flip that backwards. And we're going to say that if there's any one of those names that for whatever reason you think should not be standing for the office of elder or deacon to, to do kind of reverse anti-vote, to say, please, no, not that person, and then maybe list the reasons as to why not. Based on the number of people that we have in our congregation, unless we have a, a a majority of people saying, no, not that person, will consider those people to be uh, ratified by the congregation. So uh, just trying to figure out some timelines on this. We're, we're hoping that this will be able to take place on uh, June 21st with the installation on June 28th, but everything's always changing. So we don't know if that's actually going to happen. So uh, a little bit to bring to your attention. Uh, who we have nominated for the office of elder is we have Greg Harnden, Tony Geronimus, Ed Petrusma, Mike Schulenberg, Carl Van Claveren, and Maurice Van Eggman nominated for the office of elder. Office of Deacon... Currently, there are no deacon candidates, and so management team is in the process of trying to come up with an alternative plan, so please pray for us on this. Please pray for us as we try and navigate what do we do with uh, all the candidates and nominees that we had uh, come forward with that for one reason or another, they declined that invitation. So keep that in your prayers. So at this point in time, we would like to begin our worship service with the call to worship. So I'd like to invite David Burnside to come on forward and to lead us in a call to worship. The call to worship comes from Isaiah 43, 1 to 3. 
But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the river, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I've been washed, I've been washed by 
Our call to confession comes from Romans 3, verses 11 through 18, in which we are faced with the really uncomfortable reality that uh, we're not righteous, that we're imperfect. And here's what Romans 3, verses 11 through 18 says. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's, there's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of viper is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace, they don't know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Painful picture that Paul paints, right? Like, who would want to have that as the, 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 the motto for their life? And yet Paul is saying that is true for the entire human race. No one, not even one person, is righteous. And a little bit later on in the service, we're going to be looking at how the Apostle Peter calls people to repent acknowledging that we so desperately need a Savior because we are so wicked and unrighteous on our own. So with those words, I invite you to join with me in a prayer of confession. Let's bow before God in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we hear those words, we read those words, and we don't like them. We really wish that we could say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. We like to be able to hold forward the, the good deeds that we do and, and, and try and present ourselves as better than we are. And yet, Lord, when we do that, we undermine our desperate need for you. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, in whom there is no sin. And Jesus, with those words that we've heard, that there's no one righteous, not even one, 
We pray that as we hear those words, they, they won't bring us to a place of hopelessness and despair and browbeating and guilt and shame, but instead that they will draw our eyes towards you, the one righteous one, the one who is holy, the one in whom there is no sin. And so, Jesus, we come to you and we confess that that is true for us, that we are not righteous. We confess that, that, that our feet are swift to run to ruin and misery. We, we confess that our mouths quite often curse and, and gossip. And that hatred lives within our hearts. And we confess these things and throw ourselves at your feet saying, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, for your Holy Spirit to change us and transform us into your image and your likeness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The good news of the gospel is also found just a little bit later in Romans chapter 3, in which Paul highlights that the righteousness of Jesus Christ came to set us free. And because Jesus and his righteousness is what sets us free, here's what Paul asks in, in verse 27. He says, well, where then is the boasting? Well, boasting, it, it's excluded. Well, on what law is boasting excluded? On the law of works? No. It's excluded on the law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not also the God of Gentiles? Yes. Yes, God is the God of the Gentiles. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by faith? By no means. Instead, we uphold the law through faith in Jesus Christ. These words right here are a, a wonderful assurance that our boasting, our works, our pride, all of it's excluded on the grace and the mercy of who Jesus Christ is. And when we receive Jesus Christ's grace and mercy, we then are invited to pursue him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're invited to have our lives marked by the nature of who God is. And so I, I invite you this morning to hear the Ten Commandments not as a list of rules that do this in order to make God happy with you, but instead to hear the Ten Commandments as an invitation that your identity has been shaped and changed by Jesus Christ. And so may your life demonstrate it by living this way. And God spoke all these words to the people. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, so you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in, in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents, the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love, love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh, the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, or your daughter, nor your male servants, or your female servants, nor your animals, nor the foreigner residing in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested. Ah, he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is God's law. 
his desire for us to pursue his kingdom, to pursue his family name, to embrace these attribute, attributes with our lives and so demonstrate to the world that this is the kind of kingdom that our God is establishing for us. I invite you to stand and to sing a song of praise. This morning, we're going to be reading again from Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 36 through 41. Uh, last week, we looked at a larger section of these verses from Acts chapter 2. And what we looked at last week was the establishment of Jesus as the true and ultimate king. That his kingdom is uh, far surpasses any kingdom of this world, even the greatest kingdom that the ancient Israelites could think of, that of King David. Because his kingdom never ends and he dwells in us. And, and from that, 
that statement through the power of the Holy Spirit, God dwelling in us, we then had that challenge to, to wonder, are we truly embracing him? Are we truly allowing the Lordship of Jesus Christ to penetrate to the very core of who we are, shaping all that we do? This week, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at uh, similar verses in that, and we're going to be looking at what it means to, to belong to to God, in which God basically says, you belong to me. And, 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 and again, there, there's, there's a bit of a different nuance we're going to see in those verses there as well. And then next week, we're going to look yet again a little bit later on on this passage. Uh, and that time, we're going to be looking at more of the evidence of our belonging uh, when we've embraced the call of God in our lives. So uh, if you're wondering, hey, didn't we just read this passage last week? We did. And uh, hopefully this is a passage in which we can continue to, to pull good truths out of that can shape our lives and shape the, uh, the way that we relate to God. So uh, before we open up Acts chapter 2, I invite you to bow with me in a word of prayer. Let's come before God in a prayer for the Holy Spirit's illumination. Holy Spirit, your word is living and active. And because it's living and active, we can look at the same passage and, and continually see new things in it and continually have our heart oriented and reoriented according to your will and your purpose. So we pray this morning that as we hear the word, that, that, that our hearts will be drawn to you. We pray that as we hear the word, that we will be compelled to worship you with, with greater passion and fervency. And I pray that the words that I speak, that, that they're not mine. Holy Spirit, take my words and shape them to a message for your people. That whoever may hear it may, may stand in awe with the greatness of who our Father in heaven is. And so I pray that as I speak this morning, that your Holy Spirit will perfect the words. Make them effective for the advancement of your kingdom. And that the holy name of Jesus will be praised in them and through them. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 36. Now, uh, verse 36 is right as the end of Peter having this long sermon, in which it was in that sermon we looked at last week, the uh, comparison of Jesus to King David. It's at the very end of that sermon that Peter makes a very clear declaration that Jesus, whom you crucified, is also Messiah. And that's where he starts off with verse 36 there. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and, and said to Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them. And he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are a number of different types of groups that we can be a part of. Well, maybe not right now because of everything that's crazy out there, but you get the idea. So just work with me here for a few moments. There are a number of different groups that we can be part of. Perhaps if you've got a special interest or you're part of like a service club or even depending upon what kind of place you work, you could have a certain company that you belong to. You also have family units. Now, what I think is important for us to highlight is that there are similarities between a lot of those things. and There's also a few distinctives in that. A number of the similarities are that you're, you're, you're coming together for a common purpose or for a common goal or interest. Um, and for many things, you can come in and you can also leave if you want to, or you can get kicked out if you don't quite follow the rules, with the exception of that other one, that last one that I said there, family. At the heart of family, they're your family no matter what. You can't get kicked out of your family, or at least you shouldn't get kicked out of your family, because family is, is part of God's design for people sticking together through life 
through no matter what. Family is that one unit in which unconditional love should be present even when someone's going completely off the rails and, and doing things that are absolutely self-destructive. And at the heart of family is, is hopefully a, a loving mother and a loving father in which they're, they're looking at their kids and they're going, you're mine. You belong to me. And, and no matter what else happens in life, you are mine. You're my child. And at the heart of family, we also find the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In which Jesus, and his deep love for us, he says, you are mine. And that is at the heart of what we hear Peter proclaiming on that first day of Pentecost. At the very heart of his message is that foundation of family. Now, we didn't read it this morning. We read it last week. But in verse 29, Peter addresses all the people that were gathered there in Jerusalem as brothers. Brothers. There is that deep sense of kinship that, you know what, we might not see eye to eye, and there might be times where we're going to be at odds with each other. We might disagree, but, but fundamentally, at the core, we're family. We are brothers. And it's from that posture of, of brothers that Peter then addresses the, the, the nation and basically says, okay, brother, here is where you went wrong when it comes to Jesus. And, and, and here's where Jesus is still saying, you can belong to me and you can become part of my family. And when the people heard this message, they didn't reply with a sense of distant, you're not one of us. In verse 37 that we read, they replied with the same word that Peter spoke to them. They replied to Peter and the apostles saying, Brothers, what must we do? You can feel that family bond that was tight there, that was formed between the followers of Jesus and the nation of Israel that crucified Jesus. There was a brotherhood, a tight bond, and a tight connection. Now, with who Peter is... He was a guy who had lots of ups and lots of downs. He, he was a guy who, uh, at, at different points in times, was, was passionately following Jesus and then falling hard off the rails. And he's one of these guys that, that I love deeply because I can resonate with his journey of going, I'm full out on fire for Jesus and then falling off the tracks over here. And Peter's life was marked by all kinds of blunders, which if it was part of a service club that he was joining and following Jesus, Jesus would have said, Peter, you're gone. I have no more time for you. But Jesus doesn't. And we talked about that a number of weeks ago, the way that Jesus, because he saw Peter as a member of the family, embraced him and reinstated him as a disciple. And so at the heart of who Peter is, he was starting to realize that he had a new identity because of Jesus. That he was no longer just a person of the people of Israel, a, a general nation that was ruled by God who may have been seen a bit distant. But he realized he had a new identity that, that there was a father in heaven that called him his child. And that as the father in heaven calls him his child, that therefore there's an entire nation around him that are his brothers and his sisters. And in verse 39, there's a, a really clear call of, of a new identity that Peter himself was embracing as he shared that with the people. In verse 39, uh, there, there's a double uh, repetition of the word he. It's the, the double emphasis really draws, drives home the point that God himself was calling the people to himself. Verse 39 says, this message is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, and for all who the Lord, he himself will call to himself. Do you hear the emphatic nature of that? The Lord himself is going to call those people to himself. Peter was driving home the point that God says, you are mine. And Peter of all people, was the guy who would be able to probably say, you sure about that, God? Here's a list of all the things that I've done that should really get me kicked out of your club. And God says, Peter, you're mine. Now, I think this is a really important thing for us to consider for ourselves. 
Because I can't tell you the amount of times that I've had conversations with people in which they know that idea of belonging to God, but they don't know the idea deep down within their guts. They don't feel it to the core of their being. And, and, and it comes out in a wide variety of different ways. Sometimes a person might say, well, you, you know, I, I, I'm trying to be a really good person as if somehow my goodness makes me belong to God. I've heard other people say, well, you know what? I, I, I ho- can only hope that God would embrace me and accept me because for whatever reason they think that they have done things that would make them unworthy of being loved or accepted by God. And the list could go on and on and on of all the different things that we as a human race think would disqualify us from being called children of God. And what I love about what Peter's saying here is Peter is driving home the point, it's not about us, it's about God. And I'm going to venture a a little bit of a, a, a hypothesis out there that Part of the foundation of Reformed theology can be found right here in verse 39. At the heart of Reformed theology is that it's not about what we do that makes us good before God, but it is what he has done for us. It's not about us accepting him, but it is about God who reaches down from heaven and says, you belong to me. And and we have this doctrine of predestination. And the doctrine of predestination is saying that before the foundations of the earth, God chose us to be his children. That's found in the first chapter of Ephesians is where that's anchored in. And, And Peter is really getting at that point right here too, that God is calling people to himself. And it's regardless of what they have done. And here is what many Christians wrestle with. God calls them to himself and they kind of push back, go, yeah, God, are you sure? Because here is why I don't think I'm worthy. And God says, no, you're mine. No, you are mine. And then their life can end up being a battle about trying to somehow prove to God what God is already saying. No, I said you're mine, but here's the reasons why maybe I can't be yours. And at the foundation of the Christian faith, it's not about what we have done. It's about God in heaven calling us and saying, you belong to me. Now, when that call comes, when when the voice of the Lord goes out and calls your name and says, come, there are multiple facets to that call. First and foremost, there's there's an eternal in in, first and foremost, there's an internal aspect to that call. We can see in this passage that the people that were listening, they were cut to the heart. They were deeply troubled within their guts. They had that incredible sense of of guilt or shame for for what they had or had not done. And so they felt internally this this incredible sense of angst and an unsettlement. And from that internal call, they had to do something externally. They had to do something that was turning inside of them. So so they said, brothers, what should we do? And, And that word brother was clinging on to the idea that, come on, we're family, right? And that naturally manifested itself outward when Peter said, repent, repent, turn away from your sin. Stop trying to justify it or downplay it or or stop trying to say, look, I've I've made enough sacrifices or I've done enough, enough good to overcome this. Flat out repent, say your goodness doesn't cut it. And it's really important for us to, to, to own the weight of the word repent, and as we own the, word, the weight of the word repent, I, I think it's important to highlight that there has been some abuse in the history of the church with the word repent. Where sometimes uh, people who are self-righteous might come down heavy and hard on someone saying, here's the things that you've done wrong, you need to change, you need to repent. And that's caused a lot of hurt and damage, having someone shove that down on you. But on the flip side of that, in our current day and age, I think it's really important for us as a church to really embrace the word repent. Because our entire society is really caught up with the idea of karma. Do some good, you're going to get good. Do some bad, you're going to get bad. Or if I've done some bad, better do some good to overcome the bad. And at the heart of that isn't repentance. At the heart of that is like, oh, I did something wrong. Better do stuff to make it right. No. 
At the heart of repentance is, I've done something wrong. I need to go to the only one who can make me right, Jesus Christ. I need to humbly come before Him and say, Lord, You need to change me because I can't undo the wrongs that I have done. And then also, we've got the cultural piece on that, we've got the history piece on that, and then we've got the good news piece that's right down the middle. And the good news piece that's right down the middle is the nature of who Jesus is. That when we repent, He is quick to to lift up our faces. He is quick to, to lift us up and to say, my child, you're forgiven. You're set free. There is incredible joy and freedom in repentance because as we turn away and as we name our sin, Jesus rushes in to say, that sin doesn't define you. Let me give you a new name. Let me give you a new identity. Let me fill that space with the power and the presence of God himself. And that's what we hear with those words from Peter when he, when he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you will be Filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is just a a beautiful and a powerful rushing in of the presence of God into all the dark places of our shame, of our guilt, and all the places where we think, I'm not worthy enough. And God is eager to flood those spaces with His goodness, His grace, and His mercy. Now, if you know my family... You know that I have, I guess you can say, a a bit of a mixed or blended family. I have some biological children, and I have some children that came into my family through adoption. All of my kids are my kids. All of my kids are mine. And no one out there can ever say anything about my kids that would ever question or challenge their identity as my kids. Now, when it comes to the circles of adoption, sometimes kids have a really hard time embracing that identity. Sometimes it, it, it's difficult for them because, because they know that they have a history out there and for, for some reason they're not with their biological parents in which they might be caught in that sort of trap of wondering, what did I do that prevents me from being with my biological parents? And as that thought process goes in their minds, and they actually have a hard time embracing the truth of their new identity in their family. And I, I, I want to bring that forward to highlight that that is true within our spiritual family as well. That within the community of faith, all of us at one point in time or another had been wooed by the family values of the world around us. And as we have become untethered from that family and brought into the family of God, we, we have these questions that roll around inside of our heads that make us wonder, am I truly part of the family of God? And God looks down on us and he says, you believe in my son. You trust in him alone for your salvation. You're mine. You're mine. I'm not looking for you to get everything perfect and right. I'm looking for you to know that you are my child." And that nothing that you can do can ever change the fact that you are my child. At the very heart of the gospel is God saying, you're my child because I said so. How can we challenge that? How can you challenge the King of kings and Lord of lords when he says, you're my child because I said so? We can't. We just embrace We just embrace that identity and say, Lord, shape me. Shape me by your family values. Allow my life to reflect your family values and reflect your kingship and lordship. And as we strive to embrace the family values of God, the last words that Peter says is, save yourself from this corrupt generation. He's not talking about eternal salvation. He's talking about making your identity within the family of God clear and clean. Don't allow yourself to be marked anymore by the family of the world around you. Don't allow yourself to be marked by the guilt and the shame around you or by by the constant jockeying for trying to, to prove yourself or make yourself worthy. Don't let yourself be marked by that anymore. 
But instead, let yourself be marked by Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And there is a pretty clear warning in that, too, that the generation around us, it's corrupt. And that doesn't seem like a politically correct thing to say, now does it? You can't just go around telling people you're corrupt. And yet, the reality is that our world is corrupt. We are not living the way that God has designed the human race to live. We are not living in humble submission to him as king of kings and lord of lords. And that right there, at its foundation, is corruption. When we are people living in a kingdom, refusing to submit to the king, that is corruption. And so whenever we refuse to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're entering into the corruption of the generation around us. And I know that what I'm saying right now is not tolerant or politically correct, but Jesus Christ is the only way for us to not be corrupt. Jesus Christ is the only pure person that we can tether ourselves to that can save us from the corruption of this entire generation that's rebelling against God. And what an incredible gift it is that Jesus not only says, sure, I'll save you, but he says, you're my brother, you're my sister, come, be part of the family. Have you embraced that identity in Christ? That God is calling you to himself. Have you embraced it or are you fighting against it? If you've embraced it, praise God. Invite others to join with you on that and invite others to feel that same joy and that same fire. And if you're fighting against it, what exactly is your battle all about? What part of you has a hard time embracing God saying to you, come, you belong to me? I invite you to take that, maybe write it down and, and turn it into a bit of a prayer and say, God, help me understand why I'm having a hard time embracing that promise, that invitation to come and belong to you. When we belong to him, there is goodness, there is joy, and there is freedom. Let's bow before God in prayer. Jesus, we belong to you above all else. Jesus, you are God, you are King. And Jesus, you say that we're your brothers and your sisters. What an incredible place you've called us into. You also say that whenever we do your will, that, that we're your friends. King of kings and Lord of lords saying to us, friend. It's a gift that just seems too great for us to be worthy of. And that's where you also respond to us and say, I'm the one who makes you worthy. I'm the one who looks upon you and smiles upon you because I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And as we began our service this morning with those words from Isaiah 43, may those words anchor us. May those words anchor our faith that we trust and we believe that we belong to you. Oh Lord, we pray that we will know that you have redeemed us, that you have summoned us by name, and that we are yours. That when we pass through the waters, we know that you will be with us. That when we pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over us. And then we walk through the fire, we will not be burned, and the flames will not set us ablaze, because we belong to you. Lord Jesus Christ, fill us with that incredible joy and hope of knowing that we belong to you and nothing can shake us from that foundation. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing with joy to our God and King.
I have the privilege of leading you in congregational prayer. Shall we bow? Great are you, Lord. You are most worthy of praise. No one can fathom your greatness. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are overwhelmed with your power and glory. Dear Father, we come to you to thank you for who you are. We thank you that you hold this whole world in your hands. We thank you that not even a hair can fall from our head without you knowing it. We are thankful that you have brought us together in Christ through his death on the cross. We thank you that you love us no matter what. Nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, we are in a time of uncertainty, a time of unrest, but we are comforted in knowing that when we come to you with our praises, with our fears, with our joys, with our anxieties, with our thanksgiving, and even our tears, that you hear your people. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for Fellowship Church. We thank you for Pastor Ryan and Pastor Jesse and all our leaders, elders and deacons, as they are challenged to lead your church. Continue to guide them, giving them wisdom and discernment. We praise you that in spite of COVID-19, you were gathering your people in ways that we did not even imagine, for ways we are caring for one another, for ways we are reaching out to one another. Lord, be with those in our congregation who are grieving. Please be with the Vandertorn family in the passing of John. Keep near to them. Comfort them during this time. Be with Susan and her family as they process their loss. Many, may they sense your love and comfort. Grant them peace. Lord Jesus, COVID-19 has isolated many from their loved ones. Be with them during this lonely time. Help us to care for our elderly, our shut-ins, and our sick. We pray for those who silently suffer, who silently go to their doctor's appointments, who silently deal with depression and other mental illness. This time of social distancing keeps us apart. May your presence, your peace be real to each one of us and may it bind us together. Father, we ask that you uphold our nation of Canada. Protect her, guide her, be with Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Ford as decisions are being made. May we give them grace. There are so many differing opinions on what needs to be done. Give them wisdom in this time. Father, we watch as our neighbors to the south are in unrest. We pray that the racial injustices in both the U.S. and yes, even here in Canada are played out. In the name of Jesus, we ask for, for your forgiveness for being intolerant and biased of one another because of the colors of our skin. Forgive us for tolerating prejudice, even in the household of faith. We are all your children, the sheep of your pasture. You made us and not we ourselves. Bring justice to our nation. May your church stand firm in the truth of your word that we may be a witness to this world. Jesus, you have given us authority and power to do your will through the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we will heed your call and live in the promise that you gave to us and to our children. Lord of peace, may your peace be given to each of us at all times and in every way. Lord, be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive God's parting words of blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in you what is pleasing to him. To him be all the glory, honor, and praise, both now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Go with joy to serve the Lord.
Yeah. Uh-huh. 